The one big change, uh, the one big difference from the duck species is that there are management plans that have been developed between all the states and the flyway that try to adjust, try to address what is the objective of this population? Where are we trying to aim for? Uh, what do we know, sort of some of the limitations of growth or the accelerants of growth? And so we have 16 management plans, uh, 16 goose populations that uh, have management plans either in development or long, have long been developed. Uh, and 12 of those are here in Washington. So there's 12 different geese that you're trying to play with on the landscape of how do you manage these on the landscape. And in this region, that whole storyline of duskies, cackling geese, and Aleutians plays out even more dramatically because Canada geese and cackling geese, the difference being the large bodies and the small little ones, there are 11 different variants of those. And in this region, you get seven of them. So there's seven geese that sort of look like this. They're different sizes, but they all have black heads and white cheek patches and brownish bodies. They all overlap in this zone. So when we talk about the Southwest Washington goose zone that extends down to the Willamette Valley, this is what we're trying to manage. These different populations where in the one case of the dusky, we're actually in a dramatic decline, while in the others we're actually in this abundance and maybe overabundance in certain cases of these populations. So when you look in a field, it looks like all the same goose, but in fact, oh, there's a little cackler and there's an Aleutian, and they're all mixed in there together. Um, so as I mentioned, these management plans uh, are updated, uh, well, yeah, they're written and they're updated so often dependent on where the population is at. With the Dusky Canada Goose, the big change in the last several years is that the harvest management went away from having check stations that hunters had to go to and check in their birds. Instead, now Duskies are in a complete closure. None are supposed to be harvested. You have to take a special test. You have had to take a special test to hunt the Southwest Washington Goose Zone and the Willamette uh, equivalent in Oregon to show, to basically walk you through identifying these different geese, acknowledging this difference of you can shoot some, you shouldn't shoot others, and this one is closed. Um, and so these plans play out because we use these three-year uh, averages for good geese, uh, which rely on monitoring up on the breeding grounds in many cases, to derive an estimate, population estimate, that drives our decision whether or not harvest is a one, acceptable, and two, where we are in terms of an objective. So with Dusky Canada geese, uh, hunting can't resume until we're over 20,000 birds, based on the three-year average. And you can see there's been years where we've been pretty good, uh, but we were in a lull in this last 10-year period, um, but we're still not at 20,000. So there's not, on the foreseeable future, uh, where the dusky Canada goose is going to suddenly come back online for harvest. Like I said, these geese are up in the Copper River Delta. Their fall migration brings them down into both Washington and Oregon. And the map, the majority of this population is driven by that light blue bar, which are the birds that are or, uh, originating from the Copper River Delta. This is where, based on the blue, which is just flock counts, and uh, little yellow dots that aren't showing up very good. That's uh, some old telemetry data, not that old in the last six years or so. And the green is where harvest, we know harvest has occurred. Before two years ago, you could actually technically shoot a dozen Canada goose. So the, a lot of this is actually legal harvest, but now in this closure period, um, now we're, we know sort of where, where some sensitive areas in terms of uh, potential harvest could be. Each one of these management plans has a whole list of, of actions uh, associated with it, revolving around habitat, uh, monitoring or inventory needs, crop degradation control and um, sort of strategies, outreach and education and research needs. And usually there's some other metric that you're having to gauge against the population total. And in this case for dusky Canada geese, it's a survival estimate. 
So if any of you have seen a Dusky Canada Goose with one of those red neck collars and white letters, that is how, what we use to get to this, to understand, well, how has the population uh, been, been um, performing in the last, whatever, span of years? Since about 2001, they've been at a fairly stable adult survival rate, which is good news. But all that is balanced against the fact that we have the big Canada's, the Western Canada geese that breed here in Washington. We have the cackling geese that are flying down from the YK Delta, uh, the Dusky Canada Goose and Copper River Delta, and then other geese, like the Wrangell Island Snow Geese that fly down from Russia and uh, go up into the Skagit, <coughs> use the tidal, intertidal uh, flats. These geese historically solely uh, fed on sedge, uh, sedge plants out on the intertidal flat. Well, there's been a trade-off, obviously, with, um, with agriculture nowadays of where, what they tend to focus upon because they're after certain forage at certain times of the year. Same with white friends. White friends are this population that has ramped up dramatically, but these birds are also coming from the YK Delta. So all of this has bound together to create this agricultural dilemma, this face-off between the geese and what other uh, either creatures or people are dependent upon uh, from those same fields. Um, as I mentioned, at different times of the year, the interaction and what may be sort of in this uh, potential conflict is going to vary. Uh, it's going to vary depending on where you are in the state, what, to, what how coastal you are versus whether you're sort of growing a crop or an actual grazing agriculture. Um, and what it is that the geese are actually trying to target. So, uh, down in Humboldt County, uh, that was where I actually did a lot of my, my master graduate work, uh, this same scenario played out with the Aleutian geese, remembering that at one point they were endangered, almost extinct, uh, 790 birds left, ramped up uh, because of all these efforts on the breeding and the wintering grounds, to the point where now that population is somewhere in the 160,000 bird range. So this whole success to now what is deemed past is very in front, in the front and center with that population, um, as it is with the cackling goose and the YK Delta and several of these others that I've mentioned. But the big piece to remember is that different forage is providing uh, nutrients at different times of the year. The geese are coming down in the fall and winter. They're targeting carbohydrate, cheap energy, uh, grains, because they're just trying to survive. But in the springtime, they switch to protein-rich diets, mainly grass, <coughs> if you're out here in the coast, or other just fresh growing crops, um, because that is where the source of, of nitrogen, the protein, is absolutely essential for reproduction and egg production uh, going north. And then when they're back up on the breeding grounds, one of the big crops that they target are the berries. Um, that is a huge lipid resource for not only when they're uh, coming, first coming down in the fall, but also when they're arriving up on the breeding grounds because they have to wait for about three weeks before the nesting areas open up to be able to actually put a nest on the ground. So they're sort of hanging out looking for last year's berries that froze and, and are still available on the landscape. So just sort of quick to, to, to show visually how this plays out, in one year, a goose population spans this bigger time period and fluctuates wildly depending on whether it's a wintering area, birds are coming in during migration, and, up, and then they're on their way out. From a visual standpoint, um, it also varies on the landscape. So you see these hot spot areas of any particular landscape, but these are all different farm fields. Uh, so some areas are getting no use at all, others are getting higher use. But even as you progress through just the season, this is looking every two weeks, geese spread, geese concentrate, these are lightly used, these are heavily used, they sort of shift in complete distribution, and then they're gone. 
What, one uh, possible reason for this, although it doesn't show up very good, is just the, the type of forage that they're getting. This is sort of uh, protein values of grass during February when the peak of that population was there, and April when they're leaving. Well, of course they're hitting that area when it's, when it's at its best type of grass. Um, and in April, it's not worth it, so they're headed back north. Another, another factor could just be availability. What these graphs are showing are the number of fields on any given day that were being used by geese. And this is showing the cumulative rainfall that occurred in that region. Uh, when, you, when, when suddenly the rains really came into that area, <coughs> geese were focused on these particular fields and then just spread out like crazy. The peak counts of birds were back in this period, but the peak number of fields, or the amount of area that they were actually covering, didn't happen until a month later. So there is sort of a perception game going on of how much impact is happening in any one area. Private lands have done a whole host of uh, strategies to be able to uh, disperse birds off the field. Anywhere from running ATVs and dogs to propane cannons to as as wildly on the one side as running uh, ultralights around these farm fields and trying to like herd them back towards the public fields uh, that happened in Crescent City, California. Uh, that was very tricky when the Aleutian geese were still an endangered species, but now that they are no longer on that list. Yeah, these non-lethal methods are strategies that farmers can take and do take. Up in Skagit, this is uh, uh, several of these techniques, not the ultralight, that are, are, are carried out every year. And for us, from a management standpoint, what we have to do is try to construct zones that reflect some of these nuances of different goose populations within the state and construct seasons, hunting seasons, that allow us to try to address these different times of the year that geese may be uh, either focusing on certain crops or focusing on certain areas. <clears throat> so with that, you, you, shift, you try to shift bag limits and season dates that make more sense towards certain areas. Um, and, but again, remembering that here in this zone, this is specifically the Southwest Washington Goose Zone, we know that what makes up a bag limit is a composition of different birds over, across the, over, the, over the season. So we try to keep very close tabs on how many geese are being harvested, um, and then of course how many violations uh, of, of uh, shooting dusky cannon geese which are closed continue to happen. But there's one big piece of this that's important to, to take into account. And that is, is that while during that period of all these collapses in the 80s, uh, sort of late 70s into the 80s, a lot of these goose populations, we were in a world where the number of waterfowl hunters on the landscape was actually quite high. This is Washington's, but if you look at the national uh, picture or even any other state's picture, it's pretty much the same scenario. Basically, since the late 70s, there's been a vast drop off of the number of waterfowl hunters just nationally. And we've sort of hovered at this much lower, almost a quarter to 20% of what we once were at. So even with these bag limit adjustments and season date changes, the chances of us ever getting back to sort of that detrimental impact from harvest alone is not great. There are ways to absolutely control some of the populations but in terms of the suppressed populations or bring them back down, that's where strategies of when should certain times of that uh, goose hunting season occur. So these are all things that we take to, into account. And these arrows, what this is trying to denote was the time at which my predecessor, the blue arrow, came on to his position 36 years ago. Don Craigie took this position at all-time lows of some of the waterfowl populations. Uh, it was also sort of right in this period of when the hunters were going down. And here I am starting my career when things are better than they've ever been. So it's a very different conversation now going forward just from a habitat conservation standpoint and also just sort of how to, how do we, um, how do we implement strategies on the landscape 
to control or change some of these populations. And particularly when certain agriculture um, that we know and have relied on to supply habitat and forage for geese um, across the years, when some of them are drifting towards other agriculture that might not provide any kind of wildlife uh, uh, benefit or supplement, that's problematic and something that we definitely have to take into account. Uh, going forward, trying to engage uh, a lot of the regional um, folks that see these geese on a daily, maybe daily um, basis. This is an example that came from the bird banding lab data. These are all uh, collar recites in the nacelle region of dusky Canada geese. That's 1,200 recites done by one individual. And uh, that kind of data would produce incredible habitat use information. That's not what we use to guide our harvest limits, but certainly in terms of strategies on the ground, this type of information would be critical. So using 1,200 recites of neck collars. Someone with a, just a, a, a viewing okay. scope did, did this on their own time. That's every dot is where somebody saw a red tongue. Yep. Wow. And reported it. And reported it. And that's the key piece. So uh, certainly that's something that I hope to be able to infuse is a, a lot more of a regional citizen science angle to this. Collars are actually fairly easy to read. Um, and a red collar is a dusky. And a red collar is a dusky, yep. Yeah. And so this is something uh, going forward that we certainly hope to try to get better input on and work more collaboratively with because these collars are being put out um, and anybody could read them. So one last one I just want to touch on real fast uh, is Brank. Just to tie it back here to Willow Club. Brant, we manage two different uh, subpopulations, Black Brant and the Western High Arctic Brant who nest, nest way up here. Uh, over the last several years, there's been this shift of Black Brant using Eisenbeck up in Alaska uh, during the winter time. Up to 50,000 birds are staying through the whole winter time up there uh, because the eelgrass beds that are in that Eisenbeck Lagoon have become so lush that they've been able to sort of offset uh, the fact that they're actually smaller strands of eelgrass and they have to eat more of them. Uh, like I said, the brand are eelgrass obligate. They are dependent on eelgrass beds up and down the flyway as far down as Baja, California. Uh, they, will, they will eat grass from the beds. They will eat floating eelgrass as it's out there um, being pulled off the older leaves. Um, and if it really gets to a dire situation, they'll jump up into the salt marsh flats and eat uh, pickleweed and other uh, salt marsh vegetation. A couple modeling exercises that have come out recently uh, have been very interesting in terms of where might eelgrass be expected to respond positively, which would maybe indicate that Grant would become more dependent on some of those bays. And one of the ones that comes out is a very high probability is right here in your guys' backyard. Uh, so we'll thought for Black Grant, I, I, though we've known it's important, or has been important for a long time, might even become that much more important going forward. So there you have it. Um, thank you for listening. <laughs> questions on this and we'll, yeah. take, we'll take those at dinner which will start at 4 30. we have two more presentations to go but they're pretty short um jackie wow. ferrier or martha williams uh, come on up okay While they're loading up again, I would like to make the comments about the MRC and the work that we have done, the number of issues that we have engaged, uh, and your ability to engage with us, which is next to my poster boards up there. So pick up a flyer, it has our website on it, it has my phone number and email on it, and it gives you a nice opportunity to both volunteer with the MRC and of course to give us money. Um, through Kathleen's foundation. Uh, so.
I guess the world just waits for this loading. You know, I don't know what else I have to say. I see we do have a number of newer people who haven't been here before, or have been here infrequently before. And I'm pleased that we have that kind of activity. This is a little lower turnout than we usually have had. And I think I said this before, but when I started these about seven years ago, I really saw them as a way to enhance um, scientific literacy or conservation literacy here. And it's turned out to be a lot more of a networking kind of um, event where people get a chance to talk to each other. We get a chance to talk to the professors and the managers of the refuge and people like that and our representatives who also kind of expose themselves to our questions. So, are we ready? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Take it away, Jeff. Here's Okay, just a couple more PowerPoints. I know everybody's been in a dark room all day. Oh, that helps a lot. Thank you. Okay. Um, so I have two real quick updates to talk to you about. One of which is the Wilba Bay and Long Beach Peninsula dedication to the Western Hemispheric Shorebird Reserve Network. Shorebirds are some of the most fascinating migratory birds um, that, that, that are out there. Some of them will, will travel 20,000 miles within one year back and forth between their breeding and their wintering grounds. They might use their exact same route year after year, flying to the exact same breeding nesting, right near that same nesting site. Some shorebirds can fly 2,000 miles nonstop. Some of them are flying at altitudes of 10,000 um, feet and are reaching speeds of 50 miles per hour. Migrating birds, um, we need healthy habitat at three different key spots. Their northern, northern breeding sites, their wintering, southern wintering sites, and then their stopover sites that are their important habitats along the way. Wolva Bay and Long Beach Peninsula are one of those important, critically important stopover sites with resources that are rich uh, to help them along their, in their migration. The Western Hemispheric Shoreboard Reserve Network is an organization with a mission to conserve these important sites within North and South America. They were established in 1986. There's a lot of, we are the 99th site. There's 15 different countries. Um, and there's, like it says, a lot of acres and a lot of partners. We are, this is the Wilba Bay and Long Beach Peninsula is the third in Washington State, so Greater Skagit, Grays Harbor, and the Columbia River are already designated as WIZERN, that Western Hemisphere Shorebird Reserve Network, WIZERN, <laughs> sites. There are three levels of importance in a WIZERN site, uh, and they are based on how many birds come to a site annually, or how, the percentage of a population of a specific species of bird. Um, for a hemispheric, you can see that there's a, it was either 500,000 birds annually or 30,000% of the population. International, regional, have those different, different numbers. And Wilba Bay and Long Beach Peninsula is designated as an international site of importance. And it's thanks to these 14 different um, landowners and conservation groups that uh, the designation is possible and had um, support from community and regional partners as well. Uh, so this, these 14 uh, partners have conserved 45,000 45, acres of land that are basically um, have shorebirds in mind. Whoops, what do I mean by that? What does a designation mean? It means those landowners have uh, voluntarily agreed to be part of this network this international network. It means that they are um, voluntarily agreeing that um, shorebirds will be one of their management priorities on how they manage their lands. Uh, there is a non-regulatory, there's no penalties if something were to happen where, um, you know, something were to conflict with shorebird, shorebirds and their management has to happen. There's no regulatories, there's no penalties. There's no laws involved for anyone else or any other landowners that are with, not within this certain designation. 
so why was this site chosen? Wilba Bay has 300,000 shorebirds annually. Um, we have about 16% of this particular species called Dunlin. Dunlin um, are yeah, Dunlin are, are very interesting little species. There's about they're called little gray birds, but in their wintery plumage, but they're quite brightly colored in their in their um, uh, breeding plumage. And then we have red knots. Red knots are at about 16% of the wintering population. Um, migrating population come through in spring. And red knots are one of those species that travel the 20,000 miles per year. They, by their 13th birthday, they travel the distance to the moon and back. They're pretty amazing little short And really depend on Wilba Bay and Grace Harbor. Um, and then third, <coughs> short-billed dowagers which doesn't look like a short bill, but this is in compared to short bill versus long bill dowagers. Short bill dowagers have 30% um, of the population actually stays here in Wilco Bay at some point during their um, life cycle. We have 43 different species of shorebirds, and that goes from, it like, ranges in size from the six inch little um, least and western sandpipers to the 24 inch tall, um, long bill curlews. So you have a great deal of size difference and you have a great deal of com uh, differences in how much ab in abundance. So from the very rare snowy, western snowy clover, which is, there may be, uh, there's about 30 on the long, in, at the breed up at Ledbetter, uh, to the tens of thousands of Dunlins and Sanderlings and different species that we get. So what can we do with the designation? What does that, what does that mean? Um, it's really, it's part of becoming part of the network. It's conserving those different, um, uh, different key sites, having more partners involved. Uh, it's connecting the communities between the, all the shorebirds go to. It's a way to connect the sites. And it's also to promote that conservation education and ecotourism. Birding is a very important, um, there's 46 million birders in America. Uh, it's a very economic, important um, pastime. In conjunction with the wizard designation, um, we had a youth art and sign project. So there was over a hundred different young artists from our community that participated and created shorebird art. If you'd like to see it, it's on display at the Heritage Museum now until the end of June. Um, they provided wonderful um, educational messages and drew some amazing art. Some of these were selected to be created into signs, and these signs are now being posted at beaches, beach approaches and different, some of where these partners places have, um, have um, agreed for them to go and just to kind of promote that conservation. And some of them were chosen to be um, on the connecting people through Shorebirds Friendship quote which is also on display just for a couple weeks um, at the Heritage Museum that was put together by the Long Beach um, Peninsula Quilt Guild. And that represents seven different important short sites on the Pacific and the Atlantic flyways um, in three different countries and is going to be a traveling quilt that is going to go to all of those different communities and different um, places connecting folks that are connected with the same places that the shorebirds go. Um, the second thing that I was I'm going to talk to you about really briefly is about our headquarters. So if those of you who have not been to the Wilpa National Wildlife Refuge headquarters, that is it. We are located on, right on Highway 101, kind of on the Bay Road, on the way to Nacelle from Long Beach, um, right across from the Long Island boat ramp. Um, this is where our staff works, where we try to greet our public, and why, where we uh, try to spread the uh, mission of what we do. That is the extent of our visitor center. It's really just a porch. <laughs> yep, it's a porch. Um, it's not the place that we'd like to be greeting the 1.5 million visitors to Pacific County. Um, it's on a major highway, but we are isolated from the community and our visitors that are coming to Long Beach. Um, it is 
in a fabulous location. Lopa Bay is stunning, there's no doubt about it. We have some gorgeous forests around it. You've got Lopa Bay. It's gorgeous. But um, this is our headquarters again, a little bit earlier in time. It was actually the home that was built for the refuge manager. The refuge is celebrating its 80th birthday this year. <coughs> So this home was built in 1941. Um, it was never designed to be a headquarters, never designed to be an office. Uh, it is now structurally failing in many different ways. There, it is energy inefficient. It is, there's no potable water. 